I will restore. There can never be the joy of recovery until there's the pain of loss. And pain can be your friend. It, it tells you that at least you're still alive. And what God, in my opinion, is doing today is he's trying to lift the body of Christ to a new level. And uh, Noah was lifted to a new level, a new dimension. The very storm that destroyed the earth lifted him. And oftentimes he uses adversity to, to lift us. Uh, Abraham, uh, when he and Lot came, their sorrowful, very sorrowful uh, division. And Lot chose the well-watered plains. That experience led Moses to the mountains. And when he got there, God said, look, north, east, south, west. See all this land? Everywhere you can see. Everywhere you put your foot. It's yours. He went to another level and he had an enlarged vision. Moses. Mo Moses didn't even begin his ministry till he was 80. And he went to Mount Horeb, a mount. He had been scavenging around out after a bunch of sheep after he had been a prince. Now, isn't it strange that God trained Moses in the palace to lead people in the wilderness. And God trained Joseph in the wilderness to lead people in the palace. So you can't always judge how God deals with different people to prepare them for, for the next, next level. And the preparation of the man is more important than his performance. Because your preparation prepares you for what God wants you to do. So there was this stripping that he spoke of here. There, there's a difference in a revolution and reformation. Several years ago, I heard a man say, we need revolution. I said, no, a, a revolution destroys everything that is with no forethought of what will replace it. But reformation takes what you have and uh, spiritually enculturates it and, and uh, adapts it and and takes the basic truths and makes it work. You see, you, you bring life to structure. You never take structure to life. It, it, it'll hit you after a while. But God is working on renewal in us today. And want to get us to the next level. And sometimes he uses adversity to get us to the next level so we can see things in the Holy Spirit as God wants us to see. And I, I do not envisage the church going out as a languishing widow on a hospital bed of affliction kept alive by organizational iron lungs and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. But I think the, she's going to die and go forth or however she leaves as a radiant, glorious, victorious bride of the living God in victory. And God has got to get that into us. And we, when God works to change us, change can be uncomfortable. And sometimes we, we judge spirituality by our own comfort zone. And we, we judge discernment by whether we're comfortable with it or not. And you can never, you, you never use your personal comfort for discernment of the Spirit. Uh, for instance, you know, some of the new music. Well, well, I won't go there because the new songs teach us to praise, but the old hymns teach us to gaze. So we need a combination, you know, of, 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 of all. Uh, but whatever, I can't, I can't use taste or tradition and call it truth and I can't use my preference and call it principle. It's, it's got to be word-based. And we get uncomfortable when the Holy Spirit starts working on us to take us to another level. And then when he's working on the whole body of Christ, 
trying to get up. And we don't want to miss our hour. We, we often preach about Ezekiel and all those rivers, and he found water swimming. You remember that? But we overlooked something. He, the Lord brought him to that door that the stream was coming out of, and the word again is used. I brought you again. How many times had he been there but just didn't get it? How much sooner would it have opened if he could have got it? So God just had to take him in that circle and bring him back again until it dawned on him. There's something going on behind that door. And there's no need for me to psychoanalyze it. I better get in it and wade and see where it leads. And that's the faith dimension. And you spell faith R-I-S-K. You see, reformation can be a, a, a radical process. We get uncomfortable. The reason Samuel's mother came every year, and a mother is a type of the church, is because Samuel got uncomfortable in what he was wearing. It was the same Samuel, but he was growing. And so he had to have an expansion. And the Holy Spirit is moving, and we get uncomfortable. We feel tight, and, you know, we start trying to psychoanalyze the Holy Spirit, put it on the couch, and try to figure out what's going on here. And all, all Jesus is saying is, follow me. You know, I'll make you fish as a man. Okay, Lord, that's good. Are we going to use hooks? Are we going to use nets? What size is the boat? He said, follow me. You know, I'm not here to explain myself to your vain imagination. Follow me. Trust me. Risk something. A mistake is a tribute to a man that quit talking long enough to try to do something. Maybe we're not making any more significant mistakes because we're not doing any more significant things. There's a lot of things I've tried, you know, well, I just, well, I know that won't work, so thank God I've been educated. But God is, is, is attempting to restore the full usage uh, of, of the gifts of the Spirit and the power tools and the fivefold ministry. He wants to restore a primitive and powerful New Testament Christianity. But it's a message he's trying to get through, not just to a few, but I discern he's trying to get it through to the whole body of Christ. And he's looking for hot spots. He's finding even local congregations and pastors that say, I get it. And they're going to become Thessalonikias because he said of the church at Thessalonikia, you got it and it sounded out or rippled out from you. It hit you and the waves of what hit you affected everything around you. And the Lord is looking for these hot spots that will get it. That we are apostolic, that we can move not only in apostolic doctrine, but in apostolic power. God is restoring and he said in the first month I'll restore what the years have taken away such a brief period of time now many scripture analysts say that this pommel worm canker worm business and, and uh, was the uh, dark ages I don't know but that God slowly restored and the old timers used to teach that and they're they're probably uh, right Psalms 126 and 4 it said, uh, I will return again your captivity the NIV version said I will restore what was lost I will restore what was lost. And we are living in a day of powerful reformation and restoration. This, this church is not going out as a whimpering widow, as I said, but as a magnificent, victorious, glorious bride Amen. in full apostolic power. But we've got to have this comprehension and God's got to get all of us to the next level. You know, the dr dramatic and the significant are not always synonymous. And we've heard so much negative that we fear when we hear these things. Well, you know, I've seen this and I've seen I've been preaching nearly 62 years. I've seen a lot of things that could make me negative. And uh, th you're familiar with the scripture in Proverbs that said, uh, in essence, where there's no ox, you've got a clean stall. And I thank God for clean stalls. But if you don't have an ox, you don't have any power. And if you're going to have an ox, every now and then you're going to have to clean up the stall. And that's what the, the, the 12th chapter and the, and the 13th and 14th chapters of, he was cleaning, Paul was cleaning up the stall uh, and, and correcting the, uh, uh, 
The answer to abuse is not disuse, but proper use. So just because something has been abused doesn't mean that we back off and forever. And about all we do is we keep score on bad prophecies that we've heard <laughs> or false prophets. And we forget that. And God has got to clean our mentality to understand that we've got to sift through and, and, and know that you know why there's no counterfeit $3 bills? Because there's no real $3 bill. You only counterfeit what's real. You get it? Now, come back tomorrow and I'll, I'll try to make you shout. But in the first month, he said, in a small period of time. Well, I know, Brother Tenny, but when you talk about all this, what God's going to restore, you know, the Bible says, Lord, all things be done decently and in order. And what we get hung up on is the decently and in order, and we forget, he said, let all things be done. Let it be done. And you get so hung up on the decently and in order till you don't do anything. <laughs> because there's always these, you know, well, you know, I've, you, you, you learn by your mistakes. We know that. One of the things I fear more than anything else, and, and, and just hear me out, I'm talking about apostolic reformation and how God's attempting in these days, in a short period of time, if he can, I don't want to come back to the door again. And just get the soles of my feet wet. I want to know what's flowing. I want to find those waters. When he found the waters to swim in, the Bible said he couldn't get over. I want to get a hold of something I can't get over. That forever leaves me changed. Not just adjusted, but changed. I want to be in conventions that I can't get over. I'll never be the same again. I got it. I'm going to be a part of it. We have to watch institutionalization. Uh, you remember the Sanhedrin? There were 70 members. You know where they started? They were the 70 that Moses chose. And the 70 that he chose became an institution. And... The next time you run into them, well, the 70 of Moses were good. They helped. They started out to be servants of leadership, but they ended up leaders with servants. When they became the Sanhedrin, the next time you run into them, they're in Ezekiel, and Ezekiel's looking through the hole, and those 70 are in there, and they're up to some skullduggery. And then finally we get to the New Testament, and they're the 70 of the Sanhedrin. Our tendency is for a form to outlive the faith that gave it birth. And they kept the form of the 70, but look at the Sanhedrin. They, they ended up, and they had lost the original purpose from generation to generation. They lost their vision. They could not recapture the initial inertia of why they came in to being. But Jesus started a reformation and he reestablished the 70. The Bible said he chose another 70 also. And before this 70, Satan fell like lightning. They were nameless men who had nothing but a passion for Christ. You don't know one name of the 70, but Jesus reformed that institution. He didn't destroy it. It's the power of reformation. I'm going to put the original life back into it and they're going to have power. I know Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. We go back into the, the deity days uh, of pre-creation and, and that's probably well so. But in context, if you'll study, he was speaking of the 70 and it seems to me that another interpretation could be that before this 70, he said, I saw this as you went out, Satan fell. Everywhere you went, Satan fell because you had it. There, there had been a revival of that old 70 institution that had so degenerated 
until it was almost in debauchery. It's so dangerous to institutionalize a move of God. But you don't do away with the institutions. Uh, you know, sometimes, uh, well, let me, let, me, let me say it this way. You remember they took the Ark of the Covenant into battle? Did God ever tell them to take the Ark of the Covenant to battle? Was it something that they were to fight with? 